والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله who has gathered us around the commemoration of his book الحمد لله who has given us the tawfiq and the wherewithal the means uh, to come to tonight's talk uh, in order to reconnect ourselves and recommit ourselves to the reading of his book uh, to the approach uh, of the to, to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the uh, utmost adab and etiquette uh, and to uh, recommit ourselves to taking this book uh, seriously. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Sayyidina Yahya, Ya Yahya khudim kitaba bi quwa. Oh Yahya, take the book with all of your strength. Take the book with all of your might, with all of your power. Take this book. Uh, and we have come together, inshallah, tonight uh, in order to recommit ourselves to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with all of our strength with consistency over time. Uh, if we have not made a serious commitment to the Book of Allah before tonight, then tonight, inshallah, we will leave this uh, talk uh, in a state other than uh, that in which we came. And that is uh, to not be included among those people whom uh, it, the Prophet was uh, made to have said in the uh, Qur'an, قُلْ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنِ مَحْجُورًا Say, my people have taken this Qur'an and departed from it. They have uh, departed from this Qur'an. And so we do not want to be among them, insha'Allah ta'ala. So we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us to say those words that will inspire us, insha'Allah, uh, to be able to take this, uh, this word very seriously. The most blessed woman in all of this seerah, in my humble opinion, is Umm Ayman. Baraka Umm Ayman. Mm -hmm. Baraka Umm Ayman, she was there when the Prophet وسلم, was born. Uh -huh. She was there when, when he was born. And 90% of the, the narrations that mention her name, when her name comes in the narration, it says, Umm Ayman, wa kanat tahduna Rasulullah Umm Ayman, and by the way, it's always sort of like in said parenthetically, right? Umm Ayman. And who was, she, who was she? She was the one who was the caretaker of the Prophet ﷺ. She reared him. And tahduna means to hold him. So she was the one constantly carrying him, but also caring for him, right? And then the narrations continue. So Umm Ayman, whenever her name comes up, 90% of the time, wa Umm Ayman, oh, and by the way, wa kanat tahduna Rasulullah, or wa kanat haduna ta Rasulina right? She was there from the, from the day he was born, till the day he died. His entire life, his entire life was under her watchful eye. She witnessed every single stage of the Prophet Sallallahu growth into full manhood and all of those struggles in between. She was there in the Meccan phase, she was there in the Medinan phase, and she was there at the very end when, the, when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala uh, took the Prophet Sallallahu from this world. She was there. And her first reaction while everyone was in such a state of hysteria, where Umar who was wielding his sword, whoever says that the Prophet is dead will meet this sword of mine. And then he falls to his knees. Imam Ali didn't come out of his house. He didn't even come out of his house for days, devastated. And Umm Ayman, her reaction was, of course she was grievous for the loss of the Prophet but her first reaction was that قُتِعَتْ أَخْبَارُ السَّمَاءِ انقطعت أخبار السماء, That the news from the heavens has now been severed. Her connection was with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that was, her, that was her greatest grief. Was now the Qur'an is not going to, we are not going to have any more verses from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed. That's the, last, that's the last we're going to hear from Jibreel. That's the last we're going to have in terms of these gifts that are coming to us from, from the heavens above. That was her connection, and her connection was lost once the Prophet passed, in terms of a fresh new revelation coming, right? So, uh, we, when, we, uh, when we come together today, inshallah, to be able to recommit ourselves, like I said, to the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we know that there are certain companions that you know, the, 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 con the connection that they had to the Book of Allah SWT was like a lifeline. It was like a lifeline. It was like their, their sustenance, right? Just like you would, you know, that the, 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 you couldn't imagine uh, not eating for days, right? 
uh, that would bring you dead. They couldn't imagine being cut off from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for days. That would bring them utter death. It would bring them utter death, right? So there's a spiritual life that needs nourishment, just like our physiological bodies need that nourishment. But not to get too much into the, uh, the talk, uh, I was just reminded of Umm Ayman as we were saying salawat on the Prophet So there's a benefit to, to technical difficulties sometimes. <laughs> so alhamdulillah, we're gathered uh, to continue in this uh, workshop that we have going, the marvels of the Qur'an. We're talking about seven keys to unlocking 70 meanings. Uh, and last time we were here, we went through three of those keys. And just by way of a recap, what I wanted to share was what those keys were. Uh, today we're talking about remove your sandals and we're going to get into that, what exactly that means. But the seven keys that I had prepared, uh, and there are many, many more keys to unlocking many, many more doors, right, of meaning. Uh, we talked about coherence, right, the coherence of the surahs, the way that the surahs are arranged, and the way that the verses are arranged within those surahs, and how there's a connection uh, between the surahs, and there's a connection even within the surah, between how the surah begins and how the surah ends, and then there's a connection to how one surah ends and how the next surah begins. And we talked about that and how that informs our reflection on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in that light, I wanted to share just one more example, if you will. And this is going to be a, a brand new example for those of you who were there in attendance. Who, how many people were there the first time? <clears throat> a good number of you, right? And people who are fresh today, how many? Uh, a greater number. Okay, so this is this how we talked about how every surah is has a relationship with the next surah, and how the end of one surah has a relationship to the beginning of the next surah, and how the beginning of one surah has a relationship to the end of that same surah, and how the verses in the surahs there's a there's a coherence that 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 in the arrangement. And all of that comes from the Prophet ﷺ. But there's one ayah in itself, one ayah that also has a circular orbit around itself. One ayah, right? And that ayah is none other than Ayatul Kursi. Ayatul Kursi. So if you'll, if you'll allow me to actually go through this ayah and just show you, give you a taste for those of you who missed out on the first uh, half of this uh, section and for those of you who would like to just uh, add one more detail. Allah la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum la ta'akhuduhu sinatun wa la naum lahu ma fi as-samawati wa ma fi al-ard man dhal ladhi yashfa'u 'indahu illa bi'idhni ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum wa la yuhitoona bi shay'in min 'ilmihi illa bima sha'a wasi'a kursiyyu as-samawati wa al-ard wa la ya'udu hifdhuhuma wa huwa al-'aliyyu al-'azim this is one su one ayah that is broken up into nine breaths if you will, nine breaths, right? And, and if you look at the, the ayah itself, it's in orbit around itself. Just like we talked about kullun fi falakin yasbahun, everything is in an orbit swimming. Ayat al kursi, we talked about Surah Yusuf, and how Surah Yusuf is the only surah in the Quran that is told from beginning to end, and even that surah is circular. It's in an orbit around itself, because it begins with a vision, and it ends with the fulfillment of that vision. Well, there's one ayah in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I was able to find. There may be many more ayat like this that also is in an orbit around itself, and that is ayat al kursi. The very heart of ayat al kursi is right in the middle. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهُمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ Right? But if we look, Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyul qayyum. Right? And we look all the way at the bottom, وَهُوَ الْعَلِيُّ الْعَظِيمُ Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is introducing himself in this surah. Allah, there is no God but He, the living, the eternal. Right? Or the living and the self-subsisting. And it ends with, and He is the exalted, the supreme. Right? So you see that where the ayah begins, it ends. It begins with the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and it ends with these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That everything is from Allah, and in Allah, and for Allah, and to Allah. You see, everything is Allah. Allah, He is al kul al kul, right? To quote Imam al Ghazali, He is all in all. And then it moves from the attributes of Allah, la ta'khuduhu sinatun wa la no, no slumber or sleep can seize Him. And if we look down at the bottom, wa la ya'udu hifduhuma, and He feels no fatigue in guarding and preserving them. Do you see the connection then? 
that no slumber nor sleep can seize him, and at the bottom, toward the bottom right, what happens? What is said? He doesn't feel fatigue. He is not wearied in preserving them, in preserving the heavens and the earth. The next verse, له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض And then the corresponding verse, وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض Do you see how it's color-coded? I made it color-coded for your benefit so you can follow where I'm going. Am I going too fast? Everyone following what I'm doing? I'm on the red now, right? So, his are all things in the heavens and on, and on earth. Right? There's a typo there. His are all things in the heavens and on earth. Right? His throne extends over the heavens and the earth. Right? Are you guys following? No? And then the next verse, مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ Who is there who can intercede in his presence except as he permits? And then, nor shall they encompass anything of his knowledge except as he wills. So the structure of this is the same. Uh, it's only by the permission of Allah that, that anyone can intercede, and it's only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that anyone can have any share, in, any poor, anything of his knowledge. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give them anything of his knowledge. So the, here the structure is the same, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will and his permission are what is uh, awaited for, for, for anyone to intercede or even to know anything. And then at the very heart, Look at this, at the very heart of the ayah. He knows that which is in front of them and that which is behind them. Right? So this is like it's the midpoint. Right? It's the midpoint. That which came before and that which comes after in this very verse. Allah knows it. Right? In this very same verse, the, the, the heart of the verse is a midpoint that separates that which comes before from that which comes after. And he knows that which comes before and that which comes after. So you have incredible structure in this verse where everything is sort of revolving around this one point. Remember we said that the, it, it's tawaf. It's just circuiting around itself. right? This verse is in tawaf around itself. The very middle, which is an orange, the green is in tawaf around the orange, the red is in tawaf around the green, the blue is in tawaf around the red, and the black is in tawaf around the blue. Do you guys see that? If you paint, it, paint this, this surah and this ayah in an image, and the entire Qur'an is like this. The entire Qur'an is like this. And we gave many examples of that uh, when we uh, uh, met last. So that's coherence. That's one of the keys to unlocking 70 meanings, right? That's one of the keys to unlocking infinite meanings. So I wanted to give that to you as a gift. I hope that you will accept, inshallah. The very next thing that we talked about is grammar and morphology. The importance of knowing grammar and morphology in order to uh, to have accurate reflections on the book of Allah subhanahu wa We're not doing tafsir, we're only doing tadabbur, right? We're, we're talking about the art, mastering the art of tadabbur, mastering the art of reflecting on the book of Allah subhanahu wa And then we talked about etymology, right? Etymology meaning the roots, the root structure of words. And so when I say, uh, for example, um, <coughs> excuse me, what asr, inna l'insana la fi khusr, right? We say what asr, asr is time, by time, mankind is in loss. But the beauty, beautiful thing about asr is that it means, at its root, it means to squeeze. So it's time that is squeezed. It's time that is squeezed out of our, out of our days without, even, without our perceiving it, without our even feeling it, right? And that was the subject of today's khutbah uh, that we gave. Today we talked about that, right? So what I want to ask that is etymology, approaching the book of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and the verses through the root structure of the of the words and how that uh, will impact our reflection, right? So it's not just time by time mankind is in loss. There's a specific there's a specific distinction about this time, right? There's a connotation that this time has that will allow us to experience. Uh, a little bit more of the meanings in depth, right? So when I ask, when I think when I ask, I'm also thinking Asiya, I'm thinking juice, I'm thinking Asad, I'm thinking a hurricane, right? All this that is being squeezed out of the skies and squeezed out of the clouds and squeezed out of the orange, it's like time is being squeezed out of my hands, right? Time is being squeezed out of my life and I don't even feel it, 
right? By that time that I'm losing, mankind is also in loss. And the first thing that mankind loses is time. Right? So we talked about etymology, and now uh, tomorrow we're going to discuss orthography, how the Quran is written, right? how, the verses are, how the verses of the Quran are written, how certain words uh, are written exactly the same, uh, the, the exact same word, it's, the, it's pronounced the exact same way, it means the exact same thing, but it's written in two different ways. Why is this word? It's the same word. Why is it written in two different ways? And what can I gain from that in terms of my personal reflection, right? Uh, how, do, how do we reflect on that? And what does it mean in terms of uh, our person, personal reflection? We believe that that came from the Prophet Sallallahu Then we'll talk about elliptical speech. We'll talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, speech where, where in English, if I were to write this out in English, I would get a, a red mark. I would get an X on my, on, I, I would probably get a C. Right? Or, or a B minus, or a C, or a D. Right? Because it's an incomplete sentence. Well, the Quran is elliptical. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when, he's, when He reveals, so a lot of things are, 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 are left for us to figure out. Right? And how does that impact our reflection as well? If I have an if statement, if I say, if you, right, if you go to the store, period. <laughs> okay, so, so in English that doesn't go, that doesn't fly, but it flies in Arabic, it flies in Arabic. And oh, how it flies when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in those terms. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He takes us to, the, to those realms of meaning, right, and He just leaves us hanging, suspended. He takes us all the way out of this world, takes us into the heavens above, and He leaves us there suspended with our own imaginations to figure out the rest, right? And that's, that's, that, that's, uh, that's, uh, it's, uh, that's uh, the elliptical speech that we're going to cover that's going to affect our reflection as well. Concentric pauses, where we pause in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that also uh, affects our speech. And sometimes, depending on the qira'at, you're going to stop in a different place. Right? You'll read the same verse, but in, in hafs you'll stop here, in warsh you'll stop here. And how that changes the meaning and how that uh, impacts our uh, reflection as well. Then we'll talk about transition, how you're, you're reading about something and then all of a sudden it's talking about something else. You're reading about uh, two people and then it uses the, the, uh, the verb for, for one. Or you're reading about three people and it uses the verb for two. Or it goes from second person to first person to third person to passive voice, all in the same breath. And what that means for our reflection, how the Qur'an, is, it seems like it's hitting you from all these different corners, right? And, and, uh, and, and it doesn't read like a story, right? Where, where one speaker is telling a narration. No, it's coming from all different quarters, right? And that itself is going to affect our, um, our reflections. And then we'll talk about the prophetic dialects of eloquence, how the prophets uh, address their Lord and how the prophets address their peoples. Right? What we can glean, the lessons that we can glean, glean from how the prophets discoursed with their people and how the prophets uh, addressed their Lord. Right? And, there's, and we're going to talk about the, the, five, the, the four prophets. We're not going to talk about the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu but we're going to talk about Sayyidina Nuh, Sayyidina Ibrahim, Sayyidina uh, Musa, and Sayyidina Isa the, 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 uh, the, um, the Rusul uh, Ulul Azm. Right? Those of resolute will. Right? Uh, and then for the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, we have all of the hadith. <laughs> right? The hadith, they tell us all the dua, they, they give us that adab. And all of the hadith, they give us that adab. All the dua, they show us the adab of the Prophet وسلم, with his Lord. And, they, and, and all the rest of the hadith show us his adab with all the rest of creation. So we're going to skip uh, the Prophet وسلم, in that session. But what we wanted to speak about today was remove your sandals. Um, and this uh, comes from a verse uh, in which Allah SWT says in Surah Taha, فَلَمَّا أَتَاهَا نُودِيَ يَا مُوسَى إِنِّي أَنَا رَبُّكَ فَخْلَعْنَ عَلَيْكَ إِنَّكَ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ تُوَى So the title for this session was taken from this verse. That when, so when he came to the fire, he was summoned, Musa, verily, I am. I am your Lord, so remove your sandals. You are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. 
Incredible verse. Incredible verse. Musa is Kalim Allah. He is the one to whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke with words. Musa alayhi salam uh, had this intimate conversation with his Lord. Right? And you can imagine Jibreel alayhi salam just waiting from Adam alayhi salam all the way to Musa. And he is the angel of revelation. And this is the prophet that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to address directly with words. وَكَلَّمَ اللَّهُ مُوسَى تَكْلِيمَ And he spoke, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Musa with words, with words, right? Uh, and so this powerful, powerful passage, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala catches Moses by surprise. He takes Moses by surprise. Moses goes, he goes to the mountain and he seeks a fire. And he says, maybe I will, I will see لَعَلِي أَعْتِكُمْ بِقَبَسٍ مِنْهَا أَوْ أَجْدُ عَلَى النَّارِ هُدَى Right? Perhaps I will come with a torch. I'll, I'll bring back light for us to continue on our journey. Or maybe I will find some guidance there. Some guidance there. Oh, Moses, the guidance that you found on that mountain. Yeah, Musa, the guidance that you found on that mountain. Allahu Akbar. Wa hal ataka hadith Musa. And did the story of Musa, has that really reached our hearts? When he got to that mountain, this was the first words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressed his slave Musa with. And he says, Inni ana rabbuka. Inni ana rabbuka. Nudia ya Musa. It was called out, even though Allah, uh, this is, this is uh, you know, we're getting into transition here, right? Transition, where it's passive voice and then it goes to first person, right? So we'll talk about that tomorrow. But you have passive voice, it was called out. Nudia. Nudia. Who called out? Allah called out. But it's Nudia. It's, it's not Nadeitu. It's not I called out. It's it was called out. Ya Musa. Oh Musa. Inni ana rabbuka. Indeed I am. I am your Lord. The first thing he says to Musa alayhi salam. I am your Lord. So take off your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I am your Lord. Inni ana rabbuka. Indeed, I am. I am your Lord. So take off your shoes. Remove your sandals. I am your Lord. So take off your shoes. <laughs> Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Wallahi alhamd. I am. I am your Lord, so remove your sandals. Innaka bil wadi muqaddas What is what is there in fakhlan alik? Come correct. I am your Lord. Come correct. I am your Lord. Approach this thing with total adab. I am your Lord. Know where you are. Know where you are. You are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. And every time we open the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Inni ana rabbuka fakhla'na alayk. I am your Lord, so take off your shoes. You are in the presence of Allah. You are in the presence of your Lord, so take off your shoes. It's the first thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to any man for years and years, for, for hundreds, maybe thousands of years between Adam and, and Musa alayhi salam, where no prophet had that distinction of being kalimullah. And the moment that Moses comes to receive his kalam, to receive his speech, the first thing he's told to do is to remove his sandals. And the poet said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa How does it begin, Sayyid Talib? How does it begin? Fatihatun. Fatihatun Bayh. Ala ra'si hadha al-kawni na'lu Muhammadi. Alat fajimi'u al-khalqi tahta ibn alihi. Ala al-qurbi nudia muya Musa ikhla'na alayka. Wa ala al-qurbi lam yu'mar Ahmadu bikhal'in alihi That above this entire creation is the sandal of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
it has exalted, it has been raised up so that all of the creation is under its shade. Moses, when he was called to a Thor, was ordered to take off his sandals. And Ahmed, this, ah, and Ahmed, when brought near, was not commanded to remove his sandals. <laughs> I am your Lord, so take off your sandals. Remove your sandals. You are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Every time we open the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. Every time we open the book, we are in the sacred valley of Tuwa. And that book, when we open it up, what, the, our immediate surrounding is sacred space. It's sacred space. You choose a space that has no impurities, just like you're in Salah. And you yourself are in a state of purity. Have you not ascended the mountain of Tur? Have you not ascended with Musa السلام, to, to, take your, to, to, to get some guidance and to take it out like a torch? Like it was some kind of a torch? It's a torch. Wallahi, it's a torch. Kamamullahi nur. The speech of Allah is light. And so when we come to this mountain, we have to come correct. And that is the subject that I want to share with you today is the etiquette outward and inward. We have outward etiquettes and we have inward etiquettes. So we'll begin with the outward uh, and that uh, has to do with wudu, facing the qibla, protracted recitation, adorning one's voice, and the circuit cycle, right? The cycle of the circuits. And then inwardly we'll talk about the origin of the word, exalting the speech and the speaker, <coughs> having presence, reflection, investigation, focus, personalization, and finally, ascension, inshallah. So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, the very first of these etiquettes is to have wudu. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مَكْنُونٌ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَهَّرٌ It is a generous recital in a well-preserved tablet only those who have been purified shall have access to it. And it doesn't say, لا يمسوه إلا المطاهرون. It says, إلا المطاهرون. It doesn't say those who have purified themselves. It says those who have been purified. Right? Because purification, purification comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Pur purification comes from His Prophet sallallahu He is the one who was sent to purify us. With, with verses to purify us, right? We do not purify ourselves, right? We do not purify ourselves. We are, we are purified. We are purified. And when we engage wudu, the wudu purifies us. It's not that we have purified us with our wudu. The wudu is what purifies us. Now, so, our, so from the very beginning, it puts us in a posture of utter humility before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seeking that purification and recognizing that the purification only comes from Allah. Like, like Dr. Omar said, that one's perception of one's own growth some stunts his growth. Right? The minute you perceive that you are growing, you have stunted your own growth. <laughs> right? No? So, wudu, it is, uh, indeed, it is a generous Qur'an, a generous recital, in a well-preserved tablet. Only those who have been purified shall have access to it. The scholars, they mention that, la uh, illa mutahharun, right? That the who here goes back to the lawh al mahfud because it's the most recent uh, thing mentioned in the verse, the well-preserved tablet. This it, no one will, will have access to it except those who have been purified, right? And it doesn't go back to the Qur'an. It goes back to the Lawh al-Mahfud. Which means, who are the mutahharun then? Who are those who are purified? Because I don't have access to the Lawh al-Mahfud, right? I don't have access to the well-preserved tablet, right? No one here, I don't think, has access to that, right? So who are the mutahharun? The angels, right? The angels. The angels, they are the ones who are mutahharun. <clears throat> and they are the ones who have access to the well-preserved tablet. 
right? Jibreel a.s. would take from the verses in the well-preserved tablet and he would bring them down to his beloved sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And he would go back and forth between the law and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? So the angels, they have access to the well-preserved tablet, but things are known through analogy. Things are known through analogy. And just like that noble Qur'an that has so much to give, it's generous, Qur'an Kareem. It is a generous Qur'an, it's a generous recital. It's in a well-preserved, it's in a concealed, Kitab al-Maknun, it's in a concealed book. It's in a concealed book. And no one has access to that concealed book, that love, that love and mahfud. إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنَ الْكَرِيمِ فِي كِتَابِ الْمَكْنُونَ لَا يَمَسُّهُ إِلَّا الْمُطَعَرُونَ It is in a concealed book. And no one will have access to that concealed book, which is the Lawful Mahfur, except those who are purified. And through analogy then, the Qur'an, which is what we recite, it will give us of its generosity, but it is in a concealed book. It is concealed. That, those meanings are concealed from us. And only those who have been purified among us will have access to the generosity of this recital. <coughs> right? Only those who can... And so the analogy then is between the angels and the human being. The angels and the Muslim. Right? And the angels are created from what? Light. From Nur. The angels are created from Nur. The Muslim, in order to even touch the book, which, con which conceals the generosity of the Qur'an, the Mus'haf, right? Which conceals the generosity of the recitation. In order to even touch it, what do we have to do? We have to make wudu. We have to be in a state of wudu. What is that wudu, though? What is that wudu? That wudu, what is, what is the word wudu even come from? Not, not, not the wudu comes from three letters. What are they? Wow, Ba'd, Hamza. Wal Bad Hamza Wada'a Wada'a which means a glow. But somebody said Daw. And Daw is if you switch the letters between Wal Bad Hamza you get Bad Wal Hamza. And that means what? A light. Right? So the word wudu means to glisten. It means to glisten in the Arabic language. And what did the Prophet say about those who among his ummah, how he would be able to recognize us, insha'Allah. What did he say? From the traces of light, right? From the light, from the light, from the traces of their wudu, will he be able to recognize us, insha'Allah. He will be able to know who is among his ummah because of the light from the traces of their wudu. And so we have in this analogy, when we, when we are... Uh, make wudu, when we, when we perform wudu, we are not just merely bathing our limbs with water. Rather, we are, uh, we're not washing our limbs with water. Rather, we are bathing our souls with light. That is wudu. It's not just merely washing our limbs with water. It is bathing our souls in light. And once we're able to do that, then whom do you think we uh, resemble? The angels, right? <laughs> we become like that. We become angelic. We become angelic in those states. And now we have been purified. And perhaps now when we sit with the book of Allah, we will have access to the generosity of the Qur'an, the generosity of what we recite. All of these meanings that, that are just waiting to unfold themselves for us, that we would have access to these meanings when we approach the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with wudu, right? We become more angelic. And just like the angels have access to the Qur'an through the, in the lawh al-mahfud, we will have access to the meanings of the Qur'an in the Mus'haf, insha'Allah. So to approach the Qur'an within a state of wudu, right? This is the very first thing to do. Secondly, is to face the Qibla. Facing the Qibla, right? And facing the Qibla, this is not just a physical orientation, right? This is not a physical orientation. That Qibla, that direction of our prayer, that is the very birthplace of the Prophet That's where this entire revelation comes down, right? 
starts to come down. It comes, it begins in Mecca, and then it ends in Medina. And we are facing both Mecca and Medina when we face our prayers. Right? We're facing that general, that, that general, uh, general direction, right? So when we actually face this qibla, then we have placed ourselves in the places where these verses came down fresh. And so orienting ourselves to these blessed places, these two blessed cities, means that we are now in that space. We are now in that space. And when we recite the verses, it's as though the verses are being recited to us anew and afresh. And we were there with the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca receiving it and in Medina receiving it. When we face the Qibla. When we face the Qibla. Right? And not only that, or not only are we experiencing these verses as they are coming down, because we have placed ourselves in Mecca and Medina, but we have also placed ourselves in the shade of Beit al Ma'mur, which is above the Kaaba. Which is above the Kaaba. Right? And we have connected ourselves to Ibrahim alayhi salam, who is the one who made dua for Mecca, that it thrive and that it be preserved under the watchful eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So now we have placed ourselves under the protection of Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam. And our souls exalt, our souls uh, 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 flee from this, from this life into the realm of the angels that are surrounding the Bayt al-Ma'mur, that are going around the Bayt al-Ma'mur. This Bayt al-Ma'mur, 70,000 angels circuit it in a day. And after that day is over, they enter it never to leave. And they are replaced by another 70,000 angels every single day. Every single day. So when we face the Qibla, we are connecting ourselves to that reality. To that reality. And we are connected through Ibrahim salam, through a string of prophets from Ibrahim all the way to the Prophet We are now ready to receive this barakah. We are now ready to expose ourselves to, to, to subahat nuri. Right? To the, to the, to the, uh, the, 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 uh, the incandescent lights of the barakah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as they descend with every single ayah, with every single verse. Now, I don't know what that means. What is that? <laughs> so, that's the time we have left. 20 minutes left? We're not going to have a Q&A session. So we'll add another half hour. 20 minutes and then we have 10 minutes of Q&A. So we have a half hour to finish. I'm just on wudu and uh, we just finished. Okay, so very late. Okay, bismillah, bismillah. Uh, okay, so I, I didn't realize that. So, so I'm leaving that. He said there's a long line. Protracted recitation. Protracted recitation which is very odd because we're going to have to speed through this although the recitation has to be protracted. It's got to be slowed down. Slow down and slow down your recitation. <laughs> so that's what we're going to say. And very quickly we're going to try to convince you to slow down. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ, when he was first receiving the revelation, um, the Prophet ﷺ would move his tongue quickly. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, revealed a verse telling the Prophet sallallahu as he's... So this is one of the verses that the Prophet sallallahu had to memorize as he was moving his tongue quickly to be able to memorize that you need to slow this down. <coughs> you need to slow down. لَا تُحَرِّكْ بِهِ نِسَانَكَ لِتَعْجَلَ بِهِ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعَهُ وَقُرْآنَ فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّلَى قُرْآنَ ثُمَّ إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا بَيَانَ Right? But the Prophet sallallahu was in such... He was so worried that he might forget some of these verses that he was, as he was hearing them, he was reciting them quickly and over and over and over again in order not to let them go from him, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed this verse, لا تحرك به نسانك لتعجل به Don't move your tongue to make haste therewith. إِنَّ عَلَيْنَا جَمَعَهُ قُرْآنَ That its, its collection and its recitation is upon us. It's upon Allah. This is on, this, this is on Allah. فَإِذَا قَرَأْنَاهُ فَاتَّبَعْ قُرْآنًا So when we re, uh, recite it to you, follow its recital. فَاتَّبَعْ قُرْآنًا Meaning embody its recital. <coughs> embody its recital. 
And Aisha comes later on and she says, Can I in the Quran? His character was the Quran. Right? Embody its recital. Your embodiment of its recital is the preservation of the book. Your embodiment of the recitation is the preservation of the book. Thumma inna alayna bayana. And more than that, it is upon us to clarify and elucidate it for you. To make it clear for you. To give you the, uh, the meanings beyond the recitation, beyond the revelation, beyond the verses. To explain it to you. To give you understanding of it. No? And a lot of times we, uh, we also make haste reciting the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We also recite the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala very, very quickly. And it's usually two surahs in our prayers. By, in unison now. In unison, if you're going to pray two rakahs, in unison, everyone, in one voice, tell me, what is the first surah of the first rakah? After al-Fatiha, what is it? Surah al Al-Ikhlas. Qul huwa Allah. And in the second rakah, in unison now, all in one voice, in unison, it's Huh? Surat al? Surat al? Everyone? Falak, Nas? I'm still not. No, no, we, we all know the surah that we're talking about. Surat al? Kawthar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Surat al Ikhlas, Surat al Kawthar. Surat al Ikhlas, Surat al Kawthar. You've never read that in a book? You've never read that that was mustahab? You've never read of a single sahabi who's ever done that? You've never read that that was in the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu But that is a communal sunnah all across this world. In every, in every country, all across this world. Trying to get through it as fast as possible. Because we are entering into a conversation with Allah that we do not want to have. And so the adab, in the recitation of his book, is to slow it down. Slow it down. Allow it to permeate. Allow it to penetrate. Allow it to transform. You know, if, you, if you're in my presence, and there's a lot of people who just don't want to talk to me, don't want to have a conversation with me, and I can see in their body language, right, that you would really, you would rather be in your car right now going to your next thing to do. Right? How do I feel? Right? How do I feel turning my back against someone else? How do I feel if, if I'm in a conversation with you and I start to give you all those cues like turning to the side like this or moving back a little bit or looking at my watch or checking, checking my, my, my texts. You know that I don't want to have this conversation with you. Right? And that is how, that is how we are in our prayers. That is how we are in our prayers. Right? Reciting the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the fastest way possible, in the shortest surah as possible, in order to get through, uh, the, through, through the prayer, in order, in order to get to that salam. And once we say that salam, it's very difficult to sit down and do any tasbih or tahmeed or tahbir or anything like that. Right? If we didn't even want to have the conversation, we're definitely not going to sit down to, to, for, for the pleasantries afterwards. <coughs> okay? So protracting the recitation, slowing it down. They said that the Prophet ﷺ, whenever he recited the Qur'an, they said that it's as though they could count the words. It's like they could count the words as he was reciting them. And the recitation, I'm just going to plug this real quick, right? The recitation of uh, the, the Maliki Madhab, which is the, you know where I'm going, which is the recitation of uh, 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 Imam Warsh an Nafa, right? That is the preferred recitation of Imam Malik, which means that that is most likely the way that the Prophet ﷺ himself recited, because this is all of Medina that's reciting this way. It's very, very slow. It's very slow. There's a lot of the mudud, right? The, 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 if you get the six, six beats on the mudud, on, on, uh, on most of the mudud, there are six, you gotta go for six. Right, and then the, the the shorter ones, which are two and half, they're four in the, in wedge. Right, so it's it's it, you take your time with it. You take your time with it. And we were just led in salah by a master of wedge. Right, and you listen to wedge how it's recited. You're not going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> no? so you might as well just enjoy it while you're here. Enjoy it. Right, like the, in the, the scholar in the book here, he says Salat al Muqarrabin. He said. In, in the prayer, <coughs> in the prayer, 
You cannot eat, you cannot drink, you cannot talk, you cannot do any of these things. They're all haram. Allahu Akbar, you can't do any of that stuff. And you know that for the next five minutes, you have nothing that you can possibly do except this prayer. So you might as well get the most out of it. There's nothing else you can do at that time. So get the most out of it. Be present. Be present in that prayer. Slow down. Slow down. Because what is the difference between a three-minute prayer and a four-minute prayer? It could be life and death. Finishing Maghrib in three minutes, an average of um, an, a rak'ah per minute, or finishing in five minutes. That could, that could, it could transform everything. Just two more minutes in the prayer transforms everything. And you say, you know what, I actually feel closer to Allah. I feel my, my heart feels stronger. My, my iman feels deeper. And, then, and slowing it down gets us there. So having adab with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to slow it down. Adorning one's voice, right? Reciting with correct tajweed, learning tajweed, and reciting with that tajweed. The Prophet said, Laysa minna man lam yatahanna bil Quran. That whoever doesn't um, uh, recite the Quran melodiously is not among us. Right? He's not, he's not one of us. Right? And one time, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, or daha wa abaha ya rabbil alameen, when she, she was late coming home to the Prophet sallallahu one day, and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ma habasaka ya Aisha? Ma habasaki? What has, what has withheld you, O oh Aisha? Aisha said that I was coming on the way, and I heard the recitation of this one man, and I couldn't stop. I couldn't, I, I couldn't continue. I, he just, he's, he confounded me. I was mesmerized by his recitation. And so what did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say? He said, take me to where he is. And they, are, they went out, right? And, and the hadith the narration says that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stayed there for a long time listening to the Sahabi. A very long time passed by. And he's just, this, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is listening to the verses from the Sahabi that were revealed to him. And he's listening to it in this Sahabi's voice as he's praying to Hajjud. For a long, long time it goes by. And the Prophet ﷺ is just sitting there amazed at this recitation. And he says to her, This is Salim ibn Abi Hudayfa. Alhamdulillah, <laughs> Praise is to Allah who has made one like him among my ummah. Taking pride in the Sahabi. Right? One of the other Sahaba, they were, they, 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 Sayyidina Umar and the others, they said, recite the Quran. Abi Musa, it was Abu Musa. And uh, Sayyidina Umar who said to Abu Musa, recite from the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for us. And uh, he recited up until uh, the, the time for Salah had almost uh, got to, to, to its halfway point. And you get into the Daruri time, right? Another plug for the Maliki Mother. You start to get into the Daruri time, right? The necessary time where it's, it's actually sinful to allow the prayer to go into the necessary time, right? You have to pray in the optional time, very early in the prayer. And so the, they, they said, As-salah, ya amir al-mu'mineen, as-salah. Salah, o amir al-mu'mineen, salah. And he says, awalasna fi salah. He says, prayer, it's time for prayer. He says, are we not in prayer? Listening to Abu Musa. This Abu Musa, when the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ was walking by, and they had asked Abu Musa to recite the Quran, and the Prophet ﷺ was walking by, and he heard him, and he stood behind him, and he didn't know he was there. And so the Prophet ﷺ just listened and listened and listened until he was done reciting. He turned and he saw the Prophet ﷺ, right? And he said, if I knew that you were standing right before, uh, behind me, I would have recited it for you in the most elegant of fashion. I would, have, I would have really just, I would have performed it for you. I would have painted it for you in my, in my recitation. Now, and this is how the Prophet ﷺ said to Abu Bakr and Sayyidina Umar al if you want to hear the Qur'an moist, fresh, as it was revealed, then take it from Ibn Umm Amt. From Ibn Mas'ud, take it from him, right? Because when he recites it, he reminds me the most, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, when he reminds me of how I received it, is what he's saying. If you want to hear it fresh, moist, as it was revealed, he says, then take it from Ibn Mas'ud. So the recitation, when we recite, when we recite, we are to attempt 
to recite it in the way that it was revealed to the Prophet We are to attempt to recite it in the voice in which the Prophet himself may have heard it for the first time. That is our attempt. That when I recite the Book of Allah, I am trying to reenact that moment that the Prophet himself heard it from Jibreel alayhi So I give it its due. I give it its due. The Prophet sallallahu said about uh, one of his companions, he said, لَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ هَذَا مِنْ مَزَامِيرِ آلِ Dawood." He said that this one, this Sahabi was given one of the flutes of the family of Dawood alayhi in the way that he recited the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, taking pride in their voices. Now, and then the next thing that we want to share, inshallah, is the circuit cycle. The circuit cycle. The cycle in which we do the khatam of the Qur'an. The cycle, right? How many uh, juz are there to the Qur'an? How many parts are there to the Qur'an? 30, right? 30 parts. Uh, originally, how many parts were there? Among the Sahaba? Seven. Exactly. And those were the first three verse, uh, surahs of the Qur'an? The first three surahs of the Qur'an were the, what was the first part, right? The next five verses of the Qur'an was the second part. The next, what? The next? Okay, wake up, wake up, wake up. Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Sallallahu ala Muhammad Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam So the first three surahs of the Qur'an comprise the first part. The next five surahs of the Qur'an comprise the second part. The next seven surahs of the Qur'an comprise the third part. The next nine surahs of the Qur'an comprise the fourth part. The next eleven surahs of the Qur'an comprise the fifth part. The next thirteen surahs of the Qur'an comprise the sixth part. And then the rest of the Qur'an is the Mufassal and that's the seventh part. So you had several companions who would recite, who would do their whole entire khatam in seven days. Ubay ibn Ka'am, right? Sayyidina Uthman ibn Affan, Ibn Mas'ud, Zayd ibn Thabit, these Sahaba, they had a khatam of the Qur'an every Jum'ah, every seven days, right? There are some people who have a khatam of the Qur'an every day. <laughs> every day, a khatam of the Qur'an, right? Some people go three days and do a khatam of the Qur'an, they read ten juz a day. Some people go seven days, and that was the khatam of in, uh, uh, the, the, the four that I had mentioned, right? Some people go what? Every 14 days. So Imam al-Ghazali says that you have two extremes, right? Two extremes. He says that you have uh, every 30 days, Allah, Allah mu'ayin, every 30 days on one extreme and every three days on another extreme. He said these are extremes. <laughs> 30 days, right, which is one juz a day, that's an extreme. You don't want to neglect the Book of Allah <laughs> into that extreme. And then three days, you, won't, you don't want to do uh, any less than three. He said, ideally, it's seven days. Ideally, it's seven days. And for talab al ilm right, if you have a student who is uh, pursuing knowledge, uh, a teacher who is constantly busy in, in knowledge and in da'wah and in the salah, right, then... Uh, the, the license is there for them to complete the, the, the recitation in 14 days, in two weeks. It's okay for them to do two weeks. So basically, two his a day, right? Two his a day, uh, sorry. Huh? One his two days. Two, ju two uh, juz a day. Two juz a day, right? So they, they no, not two juz, yes, two juz a day. Sorry about that. Two juz a day. But he said, if, if, if it gets to 40 days, he said, he said, if it gets to 30 days, you have neglected the Book of Allah. Other scholars said 40 days and you've neglected the Book of Allah subhanahu wa If you haven't done a khatam in 40 days, right? So we need to uh, get on a regular 
pattern with the, with the Book of Allah, regular schedule. And if, it be, if it's difficult, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will you know, uh, reward you uh, twice for every, uh, for every difficulty, right? Uh, you know, the, the, those who, who struggle through the book, of, I know of a woman who quit her job just to be able to do a juz a day. She quit her job. She lives in Allentown, one of my neighbors. She, she used to work, she was very, she, she was making a lot of money alongside her husband. And she said, you know, I, I'm done with this work. I'm feeling that I'm neglecting the Book of Allah, and I'm a little bit slow in the recitation, so I don't want to go back a day to work. And she has never, she's never let 30 days go by without doing a khatam of the Quran. No? These, these, these people are among us. They're among us, right? But it takes for dedication and commitment and a love and a desire to draw closer to Allah through the recitation of this book. And so... Uh, we go through the, we get to the, or the, the inward etiquettes with the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Obviously, we are out of time. Perhaps we can cover this tomorrow, tomorrow morning as the opening session. I'm thinking, uh, we have 10 or 15 minutes, or how much do we have? I mean, yeah. We have 15 minutes for Salah. Huh? We have Shiz at 9. Shiz at 9? 14 minutes. 14 minutes? Yeah. Uh, are there questions, are there comments, or do you want me to continue? The Let's continue. The inward now, the inward etiquette that we should have with the Book of Allah Subhanahu All of that was outward. All of that was the outward, right? But now the inward etiquette that we should have with the Book of Allah Subhanahu Wa the very first is the origin of the words, right? And this is wrapped up into exalting the speech and the speaker. So I'll give this together. Uh, that uh, uh, Imam Jafar al-Sadiq says, وَاللَّهِ لَقَدْ تَجَلَّ رَبُّكُمْ فِي كَنَامِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا يُبْسِرُونَ He says, I swear by Allah, Allah has manifest, your Lord has manifest Himself in His speech. But you do not perceive it. But he has manifest himself in his speech. And one of the proofs of that is that Allah SWT says, لَوْ أَنزَلْنَا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ عَلَى جَبَلْ لَرَأَيْتَهُ خَاشِيًا مُتَصَدِّعًا مِنْ خَشَّةِ اللَّهِ Had we revealed this Qur'an to a mountain, you would have seen it uh, in utter reverence, totally pulverized to powder from the fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the parables that we, um, that we uh, mention to people in order that they may uh, reflect. In order that they may reflect. That this book comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And uh, uh, exalting uh, the, uh, the speech means that we exalt the speaker himself. That exalting the speech means that we exalt the speaker. And just like the Qur'an has, <coughs> excuse me, yeah, um, let's see, uh, um, and this, this finds voice in a lot of the, you, you have uh, Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, right? Ikrimah, the son of whom? Abu Jahl, right? So, you guys know who Abu Jahl is. Now look at his son, look at his son, that whenever he found the part, now, the Qur'an, in the time of the Prophet the writing of it happened in his life. And this, uh, the scribes would write it on palm fibers, or strips of leather, right? Or hide of animals, right? Strips of, strips of leather, palm fiber, or, or, or uh, bones, right? Animal bones, right? And Aiknama, uh, whenever he saw any of this material passing from one hand to another, he would faint. He would faint. And when he would come to, they, they, they would say, what happened, what happened? He said, innahu kalamu rabbi, innahu kalamu rabbi. This is the, it's the speech of my Lord, it's the speech of my Lord. He was in a state of utter witnessing. But these are the, these are the, very, the, the, the very parchments, these are the very materials that contain on them the letters that represent the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we can never lose, fa lose sight of that fact. That these are just not just our ordinary words. 
We cannot take these words for granted. This Qur'an is Jesus raising the dead from their graves. This Qur'an is the Red Sea parting right before our very eyes. It's the moon splitting. This Qur'an is Ibrahim in the fire. Just imagine if you saw a fire right now and a man right in the middle of it. And he's untouched, unscathed. And he's in utter peace. And an angel comes to him and says, what do you want? He says, nothing from you. He says, ask and you shall be given. He says, I, I, I don't have anything to ask of you. Kuni barban wa salaman ala Ibrahim. Say, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the, to, the, to the fire, be cool in a sense of peace and tranquility for Ibrahim. So do you think the angel had anything to offer after that? And this is that Qur'an. This is that, the, this is that miracle of the Prophet It's an abiding miracle. It's an abiding miracle that the Lord of the heavens and the earth has placed in our possession the symbols that contain the meaning of His speech. And that is in our possession. It's in our notebooks. It's in our tablets. It's in our phones. It's in our purses and our wallets. It's in our cars, it's in our homes, it's on our shelves. This Qur'an comes from our Lord. It comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who created the heavens and the earth. You look out there, you look out there and you see the stars. And you're just in mesmer, you're, you're mesmerized by the stars. It's so beautiful if you see the stars on a, on a black, black night. And you see the mountains and the, and the, the, the herbage, and the clouds and the sun and the moon, and the Creator behind all of that and then you have His very words in your hands. You have the words of the one who created all of that. You have that in your hands and you've memorized it in your hearts. You've memorized it and you can recite it. What greater blessing is there than that? Um Ayman had a point. She said, it's, it's going to be cut off now. We, we, we've, we've, got, we've gotten all what we're going to get. And that's why she grieved. That's why she grieved. So to have access to that, and to have the blessing and the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave you, His words, you have a piece of, you have a piece of, 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 of Jannah in your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your hands. This Qur'an, this is a piece of Jannah, because it is a reflection, an accurate reflection, a replica of that which is written in the, in the well-preserved tablet. You have that. Who else has anything that is preserved in the well-preserved tablet? Any, who, who has that in their possession? The Ark of the Covenant, they don't even know where it is. <laughs> huh? The Ark of the Covenant is in our hands. It's in our hands. This Qur'an, this Qur'an is everything. It's a, it's, it's a mirror of what is there in the well-preserved tablet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose you for that. So to exalt that in our hearts is everything. To exalt that in our hearts. Exalting the speech and the speaker. To have presence with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have presence. To be there in the moment. That when these verses, when you're reciting these verses, you're actually imagining. And this was, this was one of the most, in, most you know, there, there's a brother here who made the Umrah with me, right? And we just did, did Umrah together in November, right? That was a blessed, blessed trip that we took as I was there in the Rawda. And, and I did not, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very generous to me, very generous. And I was listening to the Imam recite. And right to my left, right to my left was, the, was Habibi Rasulullah Right to my left there was the, the wall and then across the wall was, was his, his grave. I'm not talking about when you're greeting him, facing him. I'm talking about in the Rawda, where he is, this is the wall. And this is where he would have uh, raised the curtains on, the, on the, 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 one of the last days of his blessed life to take one look at the people in the Rawda. And I was right there. And as the Imam was reciting in the Salah, I was thinking the entire time, the Prophet is hearing these verses recited. And how is he, pray tell, experiencing the, the recitation of these verses that were revealed to him? 
And do they, do, and, and does this voice sound familiar to him? Does it remind him of Abu Musa or Salim or Ibn Mas'ud? Because that is a reality of experiencing the Qur'an that none of us have, but just try to imagine it. And being there is different. Being there is different. Sayyidi Tarif, he's, he, he, you know, SubhanAllah, what can we say in his presence? What can we say in his presence? The last time he was there, well not the last time, maybe a few months ago he was there, and he addressed the Prophet Sallallahu I hope you don't mind me sharing this. He addressed the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the last time, uh, maybe a few months ago. How many months ago? Four months ago? One, uh, no, no, not the last time, but the, uh, this December. Uh, and he said to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, نَسْتَأْتِنُكُمْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ نَزُورُ أَهَالِنَا ثُمَّ نَعُودُ إِلَيْكُمْ he says, I seek your permission, O Rasulullah, just to go visit my family and my, and my children and, and, and to come back, inshallah. Right? Where is his family and his children? Here in Northern California. So he sought the permission of the Prophet ﷺ just to come back, just to see his family and then come back, to the, come back home. And after he sought permission from the Prophet ﷺ, he has made Umrah three or four more times after that. Right? How many more times? Four times. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> and he's invited to go. When are you going again? April. April for this. So, so the so so he's going back. He's going back home again and again and again to the messenger. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So there's a reality. There's a reality to the recitation of this book. And then when we face the qibla, we are connecting ourselves to all of that, to the place, to the places where these verses would come down one after another. And wherever the Prophet sallallahu was when he received the verse is the sacred valley of Tuwa. Wherever he came, wherever that verse found the Prophet ﷺ, that is a piece of the sacred valley of Tuwa. So remove your sandals. You're in Mecca, you're in Medina. You're in Mecca and Medina. So when we face the Qibla, inwardly, we're there. We're there with the Prophet ﷺ. These verses that, are, that we're reciting, we're, we're, we're imagining that we're there with the Prophet ﷺ as he's receiving.